the holiest day of the Jewish year, the most intense occasion of the Jewish calendar, begins with a total mystery. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, begins with the recitation of Kol Nidre, the chanting in somber, reverent, haunting, dramatic tones by a cantor surrounded by the leaders of the congregation holding on to Torah scrolls. This is what initiates the day. This is what sets the tone for the Day of Atonement. It has captured the awe of Jews of every point of religious commitment and observance. And indeed, it's captured the attention of the entire world. And it's entered into the awareness of popular culture, most famously through the movie The Jazz Singer in its many iterations over the generations, sung by iconic celebrities such as Al Jolson in 1927 and Jerry Lewis in 1959 and Neil Diamond in 1980. Everyone knows Kol Nidre. And it must be obvious that this is a deeply meaningful prayer about sin, forgiveness, repentance, and the possibility of redemption, about the relationship between man and God and how it's weakened by iniquity and how it can be restored and elevated. In reality, none of that is true. Kol Nidre is not a prayer about all of these themes of Yom Kippur. It's not a prayer about sin, about repentance, about redemption, or about anything else. In fact, Kol Nidre is not a prayer at all. What is it? It is a very technical, legal process, as we can see from looking at the translation for a moment. Essentially, what it is, is a release from the commitment of vows and of the consequence and effects of these commitments of the past and of the future. That is astounding. Everybody knows Kol Nidre. The evening is even called Kol Nidre Night. How could it not be about the central themes of the day? And the truth is, the mystery is even deeper than that. There are so many more questions. Yes, it's true, if we're going to start a new year, we don't want to be burdened with unfulfilled commitments from the past. And it makes sense to deal with that. But that's usually done a few days earlier in a more private setting. To do so publicly as the opening event of Yom Kippur, it's not only inappropriate, it's embarrassing. This is the message that we're beginning with when we ask God for another chance. Yes, we messed up. What can we do? Don't trust us. And it's worth appreciating that this central misfit was a topic of intense debate and it wasn't always accepted among the Jewish people that we recited Kol Nidre in the first place. There were many rabbis who opposed this recitation. Is this the message that we want to send? That our commitments aren't binding? That we can be released from them and they don't really matter? There was, in addition to this, a debate in the medieval era are we indeed focusing on the past, on being absolved of what we didn't do last year? Or, as Rabbeinu Tam, one of the great medieval commentators, understood, are we addressing the next year, prospectively? We're saying that all of our commitments for the upcoming year shouldn't be binding. Either way, isn't that a terrible message for us? Doesn't that undermine everything we're trying to accomplish? Yes, we didn't do what we said last year. Let's forget about that. Next year, whatever we say doesn't mean anything. Please accept our repentance and give us a new year. How does that fit? As you can imagine, this has fed quite a bit of anti-Semitism over the years. Solidifying the image of the Jew as duplicitous or untrustworthy, certainly not 
helpful. And indeed, throughout the centuries, up until the beginning of the 20th century, in European courts, Jews were forced to take a special oath in order to overcome this reputation that Kol Nidre seemed to contribute to, that they couldn't be trusted. Now, of course, that's built on a mistake because Kol Nidre never addressed commitments between people in the monetary realm or any other such environment. It's simply about our relationship and our commitments to God. But again, on Yom Kippur, when we're talking to God and asking for another chance, how does a declaration such as this, how does it fit? How does it make any sense? Mina Yisrael, Jewish custom, is a vital component of Jewish practice. And it contains layer upon layer. And perhaps if we explore that a little bit, we can maybe find some messages and some meanings that might contribute to the surprising prominence and placement of Kol Nidre and may help us understand how it fits with the themes of this holiest day of Yom Kippur. Over these next few minutes, I'd like to share with you a few possible approaches that may give us a little bit of a perspective. For the first approach, let's go back to Yom Kippur night of 1964. Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb of blessed memory, whose loss is still fresh just a few months ago, a leader of Yeshiva University and of modern orthodoxy for so many decades, was at that point the rabbi of the Jewish Center in Manhattan. And in his Kol Nidre address, Yom Kippur night, he talked about what he called the royal reach. Based on the words of the poet Robert Browning, who wrote that a man's reach must always exceed his grasp. And building on that, Rabbi Lamb talked about the importance of setting aspirations that were beyond what we're currently capable of, and aspiring to more, of looking to lift up what we can do through these goals. Building on this idea, we can understand that perhaps the placement of Kol Nidre, where and when it takes place, is not necessarily embarrassing, but maybe actually it's a source of pride. Here we're standing before God at this moment and at this place, and we're saying, yes, it's true, that over this past year, we didn't live up to everything that we committed to doing. And you know why that is? Because we were doing what we were supposed to do. Because we set our sights high. Because we aimed beyond our capacity. Because our reach exceeded our grasp. So indeed, it's going to be the case that we're not going to always fulfill everything we set out to do. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And what would be embarrassing? It would be embarrassing if we would come here and say we did accomplish everything that we set out to last year. Because that would mean we aimed too low. And we failed to have that royal reach. So yes, we'll stand up here before Yom Kippur and say we didn't accomplish everything we committed to last year. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And God, if you'll give us another year of life, We'll stand here again next year and we'll say the same thing. And that's not a reason not to trust us. In fact, that's the very reason our prayers should be answered. For a second approach, let's come at it from the opposite angle. And let's acknowledge that it is embarrassing to stand at that point, with all eyes upon us in front of the congregation, and to say, we have failed. We haven't done what we set out to do. But maybe that embarrassment is also productive. Maybe that's a part of the point. That here, in order to grow, in order to be the people we can be, 
we need to sometimes take stock to make an assessment. Are we better this year than we were last year? And if not, why not? What went wrong? What needs to be fixed? And that happens in public at this time and at this place, perhaps as a sort of pre-commitment strategy. As we sometimes see if someone's starting a diet and he makes sure to tell everyone so they'll know, so that he'll be held to that commitment, so that he will be accountable. So too we make this public declaration every year and we say next year we're going to do it again. And we're going to have to ask ourselves then as well, are we better next year than we were this year? And if not, why not? And the fact that we do that, not alone, but communally, actually makes it more effective. And we stand in front of each other and we say, we weren't the people we wanted to be this past year. And we've all felt the effects of that. We've all been there. We've all fallen short. We all know what that's like. And together, we can commit to a constant process of asking that question. How can we make next year a little better than the last? And we can stand as a community in front of God and say that we all recognize what that means to not live up to the standards that we set for ourselves. But we commit to a process, if not the details and that we will be here again and again, always looking to guarantee that even if we won't be perfect next year, we'll be just that much better than we were until now. For a third and final approach, maybe we could focus on an additional surprising aspect of Kol Nidre. If we're about to begin Yom Kippur and to ask God for another year, for another chance, and we're trying to make the case that we're worthy to take away the power of promise, to negate the power of our commitments, seems to be completely counterproductive. God, trust me that I can be better this year, and also know that whatever I say is meaningless. How is that helpful? How is that leaving us in a stronger place by taking away this crucial tool? And maybe that's a little bit of the answer. That maybe the power of promise is not always a tool, but it's sometimes a crutch and allows us to escape the consequences of today by relying on the promise of a better tomorrow. And in fact, in modern usage, the word promise often takes on a cynical connotation. We associate it with politicians who we don't even expect to live up to what they tell us when they're campaigning. The very word promise has taken on a meaning that yes, tomorrow will hopefully be better. Maybe, who knows. In her book, The Willpower Instinct, Kelly McGonigal discusses the phenomenon of how tomorrow licenses today. And she draws on the work of behavioral economist Howard Rochlin, who talks about the cognitive crutch of always believing that there is a tomorrow to which we can push our hopes and aspirations. And he suggested that if one is looking to change a behavior, the goal shouldn't be I will reduce this behavior in the coming days. But the focus instead should be as seeing today as representative of what every day will be if I don't change that behavior right now. And as McGonagall puts it, view every choice you make as a commitment to all future choices. So instead of asking, do I want to eat this candy bar now? Ask yourself, do I want the consequences of eating a candy bar every afternoon for the next year? Or if you've been putting something off that you know you should do, instead of asking, would I rather do this today or tomorrow? 
ask yourself, do I really want the consequence of always pushing this off? Maimonides ruled that one must repent not only for behaviors, but also for midos, for character traits. Essentially, we have to eventually acknowledge that what we do is what we are, and what we are is what we do. But another comment of Maimonides may be even more relevant. The Mishnah tells us that one who declares, I'll sin, and then I'll repent later, is not going to find repentance effective. And you would understand, reading this, that the issue is that you're gaming the system. Okay, I know there is an out of repentance, so therefore I can do what I want today and I'll repent tomorrow. That's not going to be accepted. God is not going to welcome such repentance. But if we look in Maimonides' code, it's interesting that he records this concept, but he also groups it together with a number of other issues in repentance, and he concludes that if one nonetheless does repent, that repentance is accepted. What he's teaching us is that one who says, I'll sin today and I'll repent tomorrow, is not being cynical, but he's in denial. He thinks that there will always be a tomorrow when he can repent, when he can take a different path. And that will prevent today from ever realizing itself. If one does overcome this tendency and one does repent, it will still be accepted. But the issue is the mindset that there's always the possibility of promising. What Howard Rachlin called a cognitive crutch, that's what gets in our way. Imagine Yom Kippur without the ability to promise, to push off our growth to a hypothetical tomorrow. Imagine personal relationships. Imagine marriage, where there's no possibility of promising that tomorrow will be better. What would they be forced to become today? Imagine no tomorrow. Not because we could die, but because tomorrow is today. In other words, imagine no tomorrow, not because we may die tomorrow, but because we may live tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after that. And how would we feel if all those tomorrows were no better than today? Taking away the possibility of promise allows us to stop promising and to start living. The picture of that being, of that living, is worth more than a thousand words. We can't solve the mystery of Kol Nidre because it emerges from centuries of Jewish emotion and wisdom and spiritual complexity. Perhaps it's a testament to the importance of spiritual striving. Perhaps it's an act of soul-searching individually and communally. Perhaps it is a bold declaration that we're not going to wait any longer to be the people we need to be. And perhaps it's all of these things. The customs of the Jewish people contain worlds within them. And the wonder is, they can all be true. And it takes a day of wonder, such as Yom Kippur, and a moment of majesty, such as Kol Nidre, to bring that to life.